Hello and welcome to this edition of Inside Egypt. I'm Mike Hanna. Three years after the revolution that offered so much promise for change, is Egypt repeating the mistakes of the past? In 2011, a president who came from the military was in power, and a Hosni Mubarak protest was stifled, arbitrary arrests were common, and people were held without charge. Fast forward to today, that is the picture once more. And yet again, a man from the military is directing events. Abdel Fattah el-Sisi has effectively led Egypt for the past year. But this week, he resigned as head of the army so he can run for president. It brought protesters back onto the streets on Friday. Some of them supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood and the deposed President Mohamed Morsi, who Sisi forced out of office last July. Others opposed to the way the military unseated an elected government. Five people, including a journalist, died in the protests. But there was support for Sisi too, backing for the man who promised to stand for a modern and democratic Egypt and fight the threat of what he called terrorism. I have spent my whole life as a soldier serving this country and serving its hope and aspirations, and so I will continue. Never can anyone force Egyptians to vote for a president they do not want. Those days are over. Therefore, I am before you humbly stating my intention to run for the presidency of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Well, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi has had a remarkable rise to the top of the armed forces, making big strides during the turbulent past few years. By 2011, he'd reached the sensitive role of deputy head of military intelligence, and it was from that post that he was recruited to the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the council's youngest officer ever. Then in August 2012, President Mohamed Morsi turned to El Sisi to become his next commander-in-chief. His promotion came at the expense of around 70 officers of higher rank who were moved aside to allow El Sisi to take the military's top job. So what is behind Egypt's attraction to military leaders? Let's bring in our guests. In Boston, Tarek Massoud, a Middle East specialist at Harvard University, an author of the book, Counting Islam, Religion, Class, and Elections in Egypt. In Cairo, joining us by Skype, we have Hassan Nafa, head of political science at Cairo University. And in our Washington, D.C. studio is Samia Harris, the founder of the pressure group, Democracy for Egypt. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with uh, Hassan Nafa. Now that LCC is in the political arena, is he going to draw his support as an individual or still as a representative of the military institution, do you believe? Well, uh, it is difficult to, to say, but he uh, has been uh, the commander of the army uh, until uh, 24 hours ago. So, uh, and it, it will be uh, very difficult also to say that he doesn't enjoy the uh, the support of the army, because uh, one of his conditions was that he has to uh, to get the agreement of the army to be able to present his uh, candidature. But uh, this uh, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the state or the army uh, will intervene in the uh, political process or uh, ensure uh, his victory. So uh, we, we will see uh, how the election itself will, uh, will go on if we have a fair election and we have a real competitive uh, uh, and uh, multiple, we have several candidates. Well, let's just go to Samia Harris on that uh, particular point. Your view, is it possible to divide out uh, the issue of military leader and a uh, popular candidate? Well, uh, I think he's very much uh, supported by the military institute uh, in uh, Egypt. Uh, that would be the norm. Uh, not only that, I think he will also get uh, the support of all the old regime, uh, that's Mubarak regime, uh, and uh, any of the people who benefited from his uh, system. Uh, that's because his uh, presidency will mean an extension to exactly what has been happening in Egypt for the past uh, 60 years. Uh, it's a military ruling with military benefits and uh, it will also allow all uh, the old people to uh, practice the same 
the, the same practice they have been used to benefit, uh, make money, uh, exploit money, and just get their own um, advantage. So I, I don't see how different is that going to be. If it is, uh, that then why hasn't he made the difference for the past three years? Uh, we haven't seen uh, the freedom, the justice, and the, the bread for all uh, up till now. What we have seen is a natural extension uh, to what has been happening, and it's under their ruling, the, the military ruling. The military owns 40 percent of the Egyptian economy. And, well, we will, uh, if I may interrupt you there, Samia Harris, we, we will get into that issue of the military's financial holdings, its role in the economy in a little while, but I'd like to go to Tariq Massoud at that particular point. Uh, with that uh, same question, is it at all possible to separate out military leader from politician? Oh, that, that's a that's a uh, interesting question. I, I'm not sure anybody can know the answer to it, and I'm not sure why it's an important question. I mean, think about this, Mike. If we were to survey Egyptians right now and ask them, uh, you know, who are you most likely to vote for in the presidential election, a lot of people would say. I'd probably say a majority would say Abdel Fattah al Sisi, and. I think if you were to ask them why they'd say Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, some would certainly say that his uh, position at the head of the military is what uh, gives him credibility, what makes him the right man for the right time uh, uh, for this particular moment in Egypt, which is pretty unstable. But I've got to say there's a lot of personal appeal that uh, uh, um, a field marshal al-Sisi seems to have with a lot of Egyptians. Um, a lot of people actually find his particular brand of discourse to have a kind of a subtle charisma. Uh, if you looked at uh, his speech that he gave uh, resigning office, a lot of Egyptians really uh, found that speech very uh, moving and thrilling and really uh, further evidence of how this man uh, is, uh, is the right man for Egypt. So I'm not sure we can separate out the two. The only, I guess the only indication that it's a pr as much as Sisi's personality as it is his military bearing is remember there are other military men who, uh, who made noises about running for the presidency, most notably former chief of staff uh, Sami Anan. And Sami Anan got nowhere near the kind of public adulation that Abdel Fattah al-Sisi got. Well, on that, on, on that particular issue, let's just pause here for a moment. An election win for Sisi would return Egypt to its pattern of having a leader from the military, as we heard. Widely regarded as a father of modern Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser led the military coup against King Farouk in 1952 then took power from 1956 until his death in 1970. Former army officer Anwar Sadat was a close ally of Nasser. He led from 1970 until his assassination in 1981. Sadat's vice president Hosni Mubarak took over and ruled for 30 years until the revolution in 2011. A career military man, he was the head of the Air Force before he was promoted to the vice presidency. Well, what lies behind this dominance of military figures in Egyptian political life? Uh, your view of that, Samia Harris. Uh, yes, uh, well, they do have the most organized organization uh, or institute in Egypt. Unfortunately, the, all the civil organizations have failed miserably uh, in trying to get organized so many parties, so many small insignificant parties, and they did not build the institutions that uh, the Egyptians were hoping for. Uh, so who is organized? It's only the, the military institution, and therefore they can put their men the problem is uh, they are building once again around the man, uh, not uh, a civil institution, uh, which means, you know, they're making a god out of the man, basically, uh, who turns to be the only ruler instead of the rule of law, instead of uh, the due process. Uh, so he is it. And that will be the extension of the continuous problem that happened with Egypt for the past 60 years. What we have to realize and analyze why is Egypt in this situation today? Well, what would the military ruling bring to us that's different? Uh, that's what I'm puzzled about. Why are people hailing uh, and drumming for another military ruler? That's I can't understand well, after a Well, well let's, let's, let's put that question to Hassan Nafa, if I may. Uh, Hassan Nafa, why this dominance of the military? 60 years of uh, military leaders, a brief pause of civilian rule, and now it appears a military leader will be back again. Why this uh, attraction by Egyptians? Well, this is not an attraction. This is a very exceptional moment that Egypt is uh, passing through. 
And after one year of uh, Mohammed Morsi, who was uh, uh, elected uh, uh, in a fair election, uh, but as a matter of fact, he led the country as if he is only the representative of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. And I would say also that uh, uh, this will be the first time ever in Egypt if Al Sisi is a and will be able to win this election. He will be the first military who uh, uh, wins an election in a fair election. So uh, we have to wait and see whether this will be a real fair election or uh, it will be a farce uh, like uh, some other uh, are trying to argue. So uh, we, we, it is not the military uh, rule. This will be a military who is called by uh, uh, many Egyptians to come uh, uh, to rule the country uh, but because uh, they lack security and uh, they need the, the security uh, above uh, all. Well, if, well let's we just go, uh, if, if I may, apologies to, for interruption there, but I'd like to go to Tarek Massoud on this, on this point that has come up, that the dominance of the military is actually largely a failure of civilian institutions. Uh, the argument being expressed that most recently uh, the Morsi government failed dismally as government. Is there credibility to this that uh, the military remains in power because civil institutions have failed? Well, I mean, you just have to, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of commonsensical statement. You just have to step one, take one step back and then ask yourself, why is it that civilian institutions uh, or civilian organizations seem to have failed or were not up to the challenge of governing? And the answer to that is a really long answer. Some people uh, uh, would probably blame the military for that fact. Uh, they would say that the 60 years of military dominance in Egypt from the 1952 um, overthrow of King Farouk all the way up until uh, the end of Mubarak's term, that that was a long period in which uh, the military-dominated government systematically undermined the emergence of any potential civilian uh, claimant on power, uh, you could make that argument. The alternative argument you could just make is that, look, Egypt is a fairly poor country, and one thing that we know about poor countries that are largely agrarian, that ha high rates of illiteracy, is that civil society in those places tends to be weak. And as uh, Asemia mentioned early on, uh, in such societies, the state and the apparatus of the state, particularly the military, tends to loom large. And I would note, look, look at a place like Indonesia, which today is a democracy. In the last presidential election they had, almost every presidential ticket from every party had a military general on it. So just having generals run for office doesn't uh, necessarily make the country a military dictatorship. It's all about how free and fair the elections are. Well, that's a point that Hassan Nafa uh, was making. I want to return to Hassan Nafa just to yep. explore that particular uh, issue is that are we looking at a development of democracy in Egypt? Some have argued that the return or apparent return to military rule that we are seeing is actually part of a necessary process that has been seen in other societies such as Pakistan, for example. Is this a possibility that this is just a little blip on the road to realizing the democracy? Your view, Hassan Nafa? Yeah, I think it is not to be excluded. Uh, uh, Al-Sisi uh, will uh, come if he wins the election after two uprisings. The uh, Egyptian uh, people is not the same as uh, the Egyptian people before the revolution of January 2011. And there is a constitution which uh, I do believe is much better than the constitution that was drafted uh, under uh, the auspices of uh, Morsi uh, himself. So uh, if Al-Sisi doesn't pave the way for a real democratic functioning system, he will, uh, he will fail. But for most of the Egyptian people uh, now, the, the security issue is the most important, then the economy. And if he can fix both the security issue and the, the uh, uh, bring the economy back to, uh, to normal, it will be uh, easier for him to go for paving the way for a working democracy and to strengthen the existing uh, political uh, party. But uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, Al-Sisi has a chance to take uh, Egypt uh, forward, but if he really will be the representative of the, uh, the, the military uh, apparatus uh, and, and the rule as a military man, I think he will uh, certainly fail.
Well, uh, uh, Samia uh, Harris, uh, your view, is it possible that this is a developing democracy or is it an end to the process towards democracy? Well, in, in, in my humble opinion, that's looking for a rainbow on the desert. I mean, uh, how is uh, Sisi being the president going to solve all Egypt's problems right now? Why? If he is capable of doing that, why hasn't he done it for the past three years, he and his military institution? Uh, is he holding back till he becomes a president? Then it's a gift for the government, if or the country. If that's the case, if that were the case, uh, then he really is guilty in front of the Egyptians uh, for the safety, the kids who have just been killed yesterday, uh, and the, the deterioration of the economy, the deterioration of freedom, the deterioration of the water, all these issues if he and the government that the military institution have been in control of the government from January 25th 2011 if he has the answers is he holding back to surprise us uh, and if he doesn't why do people think he is going to solve the problems now I mean people and us we need to ask these pro these issues in an open environment we can't just keep hoping and for the gentleman who says Egypt is a poor country Egypt has a lot of resources what made it a poor country is the situation it has been in for the past 60 years so uh, is the extension of the system going to make it a better country I, I doubt that a real change when you do a, a revolution you are asking for a real change and I don't see the change happening in an extension of the same regime well Sami, I, mean, I want to return to a uh, point that you raised a little bit earlier about the military's role in the economy uh, the military has a sprawling business empire in Egypt. Its members keep their accounts a closely guarded secret, but some estimates say that the military controls as much as 40% of the Egyptian economy. That includes everything from hotel resorts to petrol stations and food factories. It's reported to own nine plants just for making macaroni, which are said to control 40% of the market. They also have a big stake in construction. Earlier this month, the Dubai-based Arab Tech announced a $40 billion deal with the military to build one million homes in Egypt. And sometimes the military acts as a national lender. In 2011, it loaned a billion dollars to the central bank after it opposed a deal with the International Monetary Fund. The IMF had been calling for a widespread privatization program. Now, this is clearly an organization embedded in social and economic life, Tarek Masood. Uh, is this a consequence of its influence or a cause of its influence, do you believe? Um, you know, it's a consequence of, I think, as one of your guests was saying, it's a consequence of uh, two things. The military, after all, has been the first among equals in Egyptian politics for about 60 years. Um, and the second thing is that the you know Egypt is it ha, has long grappled with a legacy of state intervention in the economy. So it's not just the military that's heavily um, uh, involved in in uh, activities we typically think of as the domain of the private sector, but the state is as well. Um, uh, Forty percent of the Egyptian economy that sounds to me like an outlandish figure. I mean, think about it. You're saying basically. One in every two people is employed by the military. That's probably not right, but it's. I, I'm sure it's. It's a significant. Uh, uh, it's a significant figure, um, and it certainly uh, would cause the military, as a kind of corporate entity, to be concerned about the diminution of its prerogatives under uh, under some kind of uh, democratic transition. However, I think. Look. You know, the Muslim Brotherhood took great pains when it was in power to assure the military that it was not going to step on the military's prerogatives. The new regime uh, that after that took place after Mohammed Morsi uh, that took office after Mohammed Morsi was overthrown made the same guarantees to the military. So it's not as if anybody in Egypt has really ever tried to challenge the dominance of the military uh, or the military's economic uh, prerogatives. And, and that's probably not in the cards for a long time. And if you want to get democracy, Mike, in a place like Egypt, one of the first things you have to do is assure a powerful entity like the military that democracy isn't going to be bad for them. Well, Hassan, uh, your view on that, I mean, picking up on that, remembering as well that the military is, of course, uh, excluded from any civilian oversight in terms of its financial affairs. A democratic military or a military within a democratic uh, environment would, of course, uh, 
give the civilian oversight, give the civilian administrators some oversight. This is not the case. Is this not a cause for concern? Look, if we really want to monitor the economic activities of the army, it has to be done uh, by someone from the army itself. And I know this problem has to be uh, fixed, but uh, uh, as you might know, the, the Egyptian constitution now insisted that the, the, uh, the uh, budget of the military should be presented in just one, uh, one figure. And also, the, the, the uh, Minister of Defense has to be selected by uh, the army itself. So uh, neither the President nor the Prime Minister will be able to appoint, appoint directly the Defense Minister without having the acquaintances of the, of the army. But let me say uh, uh, this. Uh, I think the, all the projects, uh, the economic projects held by the army, have good reputation, and uh, uh, what is needed to be fixed is the corruption, and the corruption has touched upon all the uh, political institutions in Egypt. So what we need in Egypt is to really refix the whole, uh, uh, all the, the Egyptian institutions, and that's why maybe most of the uh, Egyptians who uh, were seeing the state as on the verge of collapsing, uh, really needs someone who uh, has the support of the army, but in the same time has a, a people that are looking to him, were ready to support him to really refix the whole, the, all the institutions in the country. So this is a bit, and we, will, we, we don't know, we don't have in Egypt any other uh, uh, real or functioning alternative. That's why uh, at CC uh, might be really uh, the man of, uh, of the field. Well, well let's, if, if I may, apologies for interrupting, but let's go to Samia Harris on that particular point. Is El Sisi's campaign based on insecurity among Egyptians? Is it uh, just that Egyptians are scared, are insecure, and reaching to somebody once again, an authoritarian military person to look after them? Well, I, I think it's a combination of elements. One is, uh, unfortunately, the media in Egypt and Maspiro is owned by the ruling uh, government. And uh, the ruling government, uh, most of them now are just beating the drum for El Sisi. Uh, the poverty and the ignorance uh, among the Egyptians is so high, so they buy the, the bites that, that that they hear, unfortunately, without going back to the history and what brought Egypt up till today. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. The military in Egypt has absolute power. And uh, when uh, Dr. Nafa talks about the constitution, the new constitution, well, who had that constitution? It's the same man who is heading now the campaign for uh, uh, Mushir al-Sisi. So uh, it is almost uh, a group that's uh, protecting its own self uh, and its interests. So when you tell me that uh, the security of Egypt needs another military man, I go back to the same concern. Why hasn't he fixed the issues today? If he is going to be the hero who is going to get security for the Egyptians, if they are going to hire him to be the president to secure the country, well, what is wrong with securing it yesterday? At that point, thank you to our guests, Tarek Massoud in Boston, Hassan Nafa in Cairo, and Samia Harris in Washington, D.C. A reminder that Al Jazeera has been unable to report from Egypt this year. That's because our team there is in detention and has been since December the 29th. Peter Gresti, Mohammed Fahmi, and Baha Mohammed are accused of having links with a terrorist organization and spreading false news. They're due to appear in court next on Monday. Abdullah Al Shami from Al Jazeera's Arabic channel has been in custody for more than six months. Al Jazeera rejects all charges against its staff and continues to demand their immediate release. You can keep up to date with Al Jazeera's extensive and continuing coverage of what's happening in Egypt on air and online. Let us know your thoughts. I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching. From me and all the team, goodbye for now.